D and D number one, a healing in Jesus' name. Chapter eleven. Shelley lay on a large towel on the beach. She wore a light pink one-piece suit. The sun on her skin gave her a healthy glow, but having had another meeting with the porcelain god while changing in her room, she felt far from healthy. Instead, she felt weak and drained. She sipped water as Eric sat next to her, his bronze skin shining in the golden sunlight. Shelley watched the wind play with his hair as it hung loose around his shoulders. Look who I found, Ricky said as he approached with his date from a few nights ago. Shelley smiled up at her. Hi, Bethany. She rose slightly and immediately her head throbbed and the nausea returned. Angel arrived carrying a volleyball. Come on, let's play. Shelley gazed up at her. She was devastating in her very tiny white bikini and very dark tan. Shelley looked around to observe the men's stunned reaction to her. All four, Justin, Jason, Ricky, and Eric, each did their own sweep of Angel's body. Everyone ran off to play, except Eric. Angel grabbed his hand, though. Come on, Eric. Shelley won't mind, will you, hon? Please go, Eric, Shelley prodded. I feel like a party pooper if you don't go. Conceding, Eric turned to Shelley. Lie still, he commanded before he ran off with Angel. Lie still, Shelley thought as she eased back down. I'll be lucky if I ever move again. She did raise her head every once in a while to watch the others play ball. Once the volleyball game ended, some of the girls rented surfboards and begged the California boys to teach them how to surf. Shelley couldn't resist watching. Eric was helping Angel onto a board and showing her how to paddle straight. <clears throat> His hand came to rest on her back. Shelley had been working on not giving in to the baser instinct of jealousy, but something about Eric's hand on Angel's beautiful body irritated her. She didn't have long to think about it, though. Her vision blurred and her respiration increased as a sick feeling moved up her throat. It appeared the crowd was coming in from the water, so Shelley decided to head for the restrooms before her illness became obvious to everyone. Dry heaves were all she could manage. She realized between throwing up her guts and perspiring in the sun, she was probably dehydrated. Common sense made its way through her thick skull. Slowly, she started back toward her towel to let Eric know what was really going on, but stopped short when she heard her name from sem somewhere on the other side of the small building. You're kidding me. Shelly and Eric are, like, together? Yes, why is that so hard to believe? Shelly recognized Angel's and Bethany's voices. <clears throat> I mean, Shelly's sweet and all, Angel's voice crooned, but... Like, they don't really go together, you know? She seems much older than him. And that's why I was really surprised when he picked her for the mart. Anyway, maybe it's just a passing fancy. It probably won't last long. And when they break up, I'd like to be around to step in. You know what I mean? Well, I think Shelly and Eric make an awesome couple, Bethany responded. Shelly's heart was broken. Did she really look so old, she wondered? Maybe she didn't deserve a man as wonderful as Eric. She felt the tears well up in her eyes, and she turned to head back to the restroom to wash her face. But Ricky stood in her way. Don't doubt yourself, Shelley, or my father, he whispered. Shelley blinked up at him, realizing Ricky had heard the exchange. Your father? I would never doubt. The question is whether I deserve him. Ricky shook his head. Someone should turn you over their knee. What's she done now, Eric asked as he joined them. Ricky backed away. The only thing I see her guilty of is making you happy. She's looking rough, though, Dad. Maybe you should take her back to the room and put her to bed, Ricky said, imitating Groucho Marx. I think you're right, Eric agreed, looking her over, noticing her pale lips and flushed skin. This time she made no argument. They made their departure, much to everyone's dismay, especially one very southern belle. Once in the room, Shelley was grateful for the cool darkness. She sank onto the bed. Eric leaned over, scrutinizing her face. She had a slight bruise on her cheek from one of the many kicks to the head she'd taken. Her lip was still swollen, but at least the red spot on her forehead from whatever happened in the locker room had faded. Are you going to tell me about the woman in the locker room? She was so dizzy she truly didn't feel like talking. Nothing really happened. I chose not to fight, that's all. 
Oh, that sounds like a wise choice, he whispered. She smiled a weak smile. I'm going to go to my room and take a shower. I'll be back soon. Shelly was too weak to even respond. As she listened to the door close, her head spun and she couldn't focus her eyes. She closed them, hoping to drift off to blissful sleep. However, the sensation of spinning and floating didn't go away, even with her eyes closed. Nausea swept over her like a flood, and she sat up shaking. She was sick, really sick, more than just a little dizzy. She needed to let Eric know just how bad it was. But one step onto the floor, and it gave out from under her. She fell into what seemed like a dark, bottomless pit, falling, falling, slowly, quietly, it wouldn't be so bad, she thought, if she could just stop spinning. She finally succumbed to complete and total blackness. Next scene. Ricky, Justin, and Jason came running the minute they got the call. By the time they arrived at the hotel, Shelley was already loaded into an ambulance. Dad, what happened? Eric shook his head. I took a shower and came back to find her collapsed on the floor. I couldn't wake her. He stopped and breathed. Ricky's face was white. Did she ever come to? Eric could only shake his head. At the hospital, they waited a 45-minute eternity before the doctor came out to see them. She's fine, he began. She has a concussion, but there appears to be no inner swelling and her scan is normal. Her collapse was more from the dehydration than the concussion. Dehydration? Eric and Ricky both questioned. We made sure she was taking in fluids. Yes, well, the doctor continued, with that much vomiting, it's not unusual for dehydration to occur. Vomiting, Eric asked. She's been, he didn't finish as the truth hit him. We're administering IV fluids now. I'd like to monitor her overnight. As long as the night goes smoothly, she can go home in the morning. We'll keep in touch if there's any change. She's awake and asking for you, but keep it short. Eric stepped quietly into her room. Peering down at the small, pale woman, his heart swelled. He took her hand and kissed it, and before he could reprimand her, she offered her apology. I didn't want to mess up another day, she explained. I thought I could make it. Please don't be angry. I'm so relieved you're all right. I can't be angry right now. Maybe later, he warned. You scared us, Shelley. I don't know what I'd do if I lost you. Lord, I just found you. He paused, choosing his next words carefully. Shelley, listen, sweetheart, I've been thinking. Well, maybe we should call the whole thing off. You mean us? His heart swelled with compassion. No, silly. I mean the mart. You don't realize how tough training for the mart can be. The mart is merely a tournament. As long as we can be together, that's what's important, isn't it? You don't need the mart. I'll take care of you. Always, he added. You'll have no need to learn to fight. But I want to learn. Eric, let me tell you something. I allowed myself to be totally consumed once before when I married Robert. I lost who I was. I lost confidence until I almost couldn't think without his help. I learned that when you truly love someone, you allow them to be free to express themselves. And either Robert didn't know that or he didn't really love me. And that doesn't matter now. But what does matter is... Once, I was a young girl with a lot of talent and potential I never did anything with. I want to continue my training. I have to do this. I have this need to accomplish something in my life. I need to win that tournament, and I can't do that without you. Please, don't stop teaching me, Eric. I'm begging you. Besides, you promised you wouldn't give up on me. He sighed. He'd as good as offered himself to her forever, and she'd turned him down easily enough. He pushed the hurt aside, going over her words in his mind. When you truly love someone, you allow them to be free. She spoke truth. You don't have to beg, Shelley. I understand what you're saying. There's just this selfish side of me that wants to keep you safe and secure just for me. Forget that, though. I'll give you what you want, but you have to do something for me. Anything, she said earnestly. You have to trust me. I mean, completely. I can keep you safe and healthy, but not if I don't know everything. And I mean everything. If you're ill, I need to know. If you're injured, I need to know. If an eyelash falls out, I need to know. He stopped and waited for an answer. I promise, she said, sighing deeply. 
The door softly pushed open and Ricky stepped inside. I wanted to say hi before they throw us all out, which they're getting ready to do, so hi. He smiled his sunny smile and Shelly gave a little wave. The nurse briskly entered the room, ordered the men out, and turned out the light over the bed. Eric noticed the fear that sprang into Shelly's eyes. I'll see you in the morning, he whispered as he kissed her cheek. Close your eyes and sleep. You won't even notice the darkness. Next scene. Eric couldn't believe the difference in Shelly's appearance by morning. Her color was back, her eyes shone, and a big smile brightened her face when he walked through the door bearing gifts. For you, my lady, Eric said as he laid a single daisy on her stomach. Because they're fresh and sunny and remind me of you. A teddy bear was next. Because he's cuddly and cute and also reminds me of you. And next he placed folded clean clothes on the bed. Because you don't look great in that hospital gown, he teased. Shelley looked up sadly. Is that all I get? Oh no, I saved the best for last. He leaned down and kissed her gently. Shelley cherished the moment, taking in each detail. His smell, his clothing, his hair falling across his shoulder to brush against her cheek, the muscles in his neck and arms contracting, Everything about him was beautiful. She lifted his hand and placed it on her belly. Do you feel that? She asked. What? It's completely empty. I'm so hungry. They haven't served you breakfast yet? He asked, glancing at his watch. No, they haven't, and I haven't had anything since yesterday morning, and I think I could eat a whole cow, she whined. The door burst open, and a young, pretty tech came in wearing a smile and carrying a tray of food. Shelley's eyes lit up. Eric smiled at the girl. You are just the person she's been waiting for. Shelly sat up as the girl placed a tray on a table and pushed it up to the bed. She immediately began spreading jelly on toast and was just about to devour it when the doctor appeared. Hello, he said cheerfully. Sorry, I'm late on my rounds. We had a little emergency. Let's see now. You want to get this lady out of here, I bet. He pulled the table, bearing the tray of food away from the bed. Eric smiled at Shelly as, Shelly as she eyed the beckoning tray. The doctor quickly slid his stethoscope across Shelley's chest and back, requesting her to breathe. If you hear a strange sound, it's my stomach growling, she offered. Shh, the doctor put a finger to his lips. He took out a light and shined it in Shelley's eyes, examined her swollen lip, and lifted her hands to look at her forearms, which were covered with bruises. So, you're a fighter, he asked, shaking his head. You look more like a punching bag, he laughed, but stopped abruptly when he saw the scowl on her face. Anyway, for now, you're going to be okay. He turned to Eric. I'll have her discharge arranged. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Kino, the word spread in the hospital that you're here. I realize you're a busy man, but we were wondering, well, the kids in the children's ward would get a big kick, excuse the pun, out of meeting a movie star. Would you consider popping in and saying hello to them? Shelley watched Eric smile, that beautiful smile that she loved so much. Well, I'm not a movie star, but my son is waiting down in the lobby, and I'd be happy to get him, and we'll go visit the children. He turned toward Shelley. You don't mind, do you? Not as long as you push my breakfast back over here. The doctor patted Shelley's leg, shook Eric's hand, and left. Pushing the table back in place, Eric took Shelley's hand and kissed it. I won't be too long. He stopped at the door. Shelley? Yes, a very cute punching bag. Next scene. It was late morning when Eric sheepishly peeked back into Shelley's room. He hadn't intended to stay gone so long, but the kids drew him like a magnet. Shelley was fully dressed, lying sideways across the bed, asleep. Leaning over the bed, he whispered in her ear, Hello, beautiful. Her brown eyes fluttered open, and she reached up and hugged him. I have never been so happy to see you. Aw, oh, come on, he said. It can't be that bad. Not really, she admitted. I just want to get out of here. Eric helped her up. You're all checked out. We're just waiting for the wheelchair. I have a surprise for you. I didn't get to tell you last night, he began, but the sponsors who came to watch you are definitely interested, and they want to meet you at dinner tonight. Eric noticed, but ignored, Shelley's look of dread. There are several shops in the mezzanine area of the hotel. How would you like to buy a new dress for tonight? 
Um, the black one's not good enough, she asked, twisting her hands together. I hate to shop. He laughed. You are definitely a strange woman. Yes, the black one is fine. I just thought you'd like something special for a special night. She shrugged. Okay. Okay, he agreed. Once they arrived back at the hotel, Shelley wanted to get the shopping out of the way immediately. She impressed Eric by taking only a few minutes to pick out a dress and shoes. The rest of the day, Shelley lounged in Eric and Ricky's room since it was a larger suite. Jason and Justin joined them. Shelley thought Eric's Korean friends were adorable and could see the love they had for Eric. Justin, the attorney, was a year younger than Eric. His younger brother, Jason, was 27. The five of them lounged around the entire afternoon, sharing stories and laughing. Shelley thrilled at the stories of friendship between the Lee brothers and Eric and at the tales of the mischief and brawls in which they'd participated. They laughed about her hungry hospital story, which led to stories of the births of her children, which led to stories of Ricky's birth, which led to Eric's late wife, Anne. Shelley watched Eric's face as he spoke about her and realized how deeply he'd loved her. Justin and Jason had been there for Eric and Ricky through it all, and it was evident the four men were as close as any friends could be. Shelley suddenly realized she was an outsider, and feeling completely uncomfortable, she rose. It's about time for me to get ready for the evening, she announced. She excused herself and went to her room. The hot shower felt good on her sore muscles. Closing her eyes, she tried to relax but kept seeing Eric's face as he talked about his wife. Poor little Ricky, losing his mother when he was only 11, Shelley thought. And poor Eric. Anne must have been an extraordinary woman for Eric to have loved her so much. She left the shower, bundled up in her thick robe, and combed out her hair. Totally relaxed now, she stepped out on the balcony. The breeze from the ocean felt good on her face, and the smell from now on would always remind her of Eric. Musingly, she looked down, calculating the distance to the ground. Thinking about jumping, a deep voice asked from behind. Shelley looked back at him with a faint smile, then turned and gazed out over the ocean. He came to her, wrapping his strong arms around her waist and kissing the back of her neck. She leaned into him. he just showered and shaved and smelled wonderful. He spoke softly into her ears if he'd read her mind. Anne would have wanted me to find someone to love. I thought when she died I could never love another woman, and for ten years I didn't. But when I found you and you, you freed me from a hurt... <sighs> But then I found you and you freed me from a prison of hurt and pain. I didn't even know how lonely I was until you came into my life. You made me love again. You made me laugh again. And even though you and Anne are different as night and day, she would have liked you, Shelley, and I think you would have liked her. Shelley let her head fall back against his chest. You seem to always know what I'm thinking and how I'm feeling. Am I that transparent? Yes. Eric laughed. Of course, I have help. Shelley smiled. Help? Yep, supernatural help. God's help. For example, my choosing you for the mart. I'd had dreams about you. I'd had so many dreams that I knew you the moment I laid eyes on you. You're kidding. I'm very serious. How can that be? He shrugged. I began having precognitive dreams when I was very young. How young? Ten. I had an accident that gave me an amazing spiritual experience, a real awakening. It's too long a story to tell right now, but it was a significant happening in my life. And once I realized God was real, and I mean really real, then it became my daily goal to talk to Him and to communicate with Him. Talk to Him through prayer and listen to Him through meditation. I began to have dreams and visions and other things too. And so, that made you psychic? He chuckled, holding her tighter. Everyone is psychic. It's just that not everyone has quieted their mind and allowed the connection. And so now you can read my mind? Yes, he laughed, but not because I'm psychic. You're just very easy to read. Hmm, whatever. Tell me more about your dreams. Well... Many of them seem to have very little significance, as if they were just practice. Some have been important, 
like the time I saw a truck careen out of control right into the path of my car along the route I drove Ricky to school. The dream was so clear that I went a different way for two weeks, and then it happened. A truck lost its brakes and flew across an intersection and hit a school bus, and several children were seriously injured. I wish I could have prevented it, but I didn't know a time frame, and I hadn't seen the bus in my dream. I'd only seen Ricky lying on the street and paramedics covering his face with a sheet. Oh, that's horrible. Well, it would have been, but I listened to the signs being given me. How wonderful to have been given this power. I wouldn't call it a power. It is, as you said, a gift. But I still had to work for it, constant prayer and meditation, and opening my mind to the love and light of God. Through that, anyone can develop a bit of a sixth sense. It's just a matter of recognizing God's voice. When you awaken to who you really are, a child of God, you too can become powerful because you begin to realize that all things are possible with God. I didn't realize you were so religious. You haven't said anything about attending a church. Ricky and I are very dedicated to God, to Jesus, and there are a few congregations we attend back home because fellowshipping with others who believe in Jesus is important. Though, when we can't attend, we make sure we take time on the Sabbath to read the Word and maybe listen to an online sermon or serve others in some way. You haven't done that for the past six weeks. He smiled. Are you sure about that? She smiled. Okay. I stand corrected. Eric nodded. I'm glad we've been able to talk about these things. I'm grateful God gave me this opportunity to broach the subject with you. I knew he would present the right time. Shelley, are you at all religious, as you put it? Not really. I'm not sure what I think about that kind of stuff. I don't really know much about it. Would you like to learn? Sure. You might as well be my teacher in that, too. Awesome. From here on out, I'll include you in my worship time. For now, let me tell you one thing. God is real, and he has a plan for you. And our meeting was not a random happening. We were meant to be together. So think about that, and also think about what you want to accomplish, Shelley. Put it out there. Tell your Father in heaven, with him, all things are possible. All things? Anything I want? Well, yes, though, when you're connected to God, you may find you want something different than what you thought. What do you want, Eric? He turned to face her. At this moment, I'm totally content, though I do have goals I'd like to obtain. All I want at this time, though, is to be with you, and I also want to go to this dinner and get these sponsors. It makes me nervous. I wish we could skip the dinner, could we? We could, but... We don't operate that way, do we? Eric answered, going from boyfriend to master in the blink of an eye. We face all challenges head on. Not that this is a challenge. They only want to meet you. They're already seen you perform. Come on. We better get a move on. I'll leave you to dress. Thirty minutes later, Eric knocked on Shelley's door, and she opened it and stood nervously waiting for his approval. His eyes moved over her. The dress was a silky, cream-colored confection with golden threads. It fit her curves, flowing gracefully down over her hips and flaring out at the floor. She turned slowly, and there was a sound of breath being released. She turned back to him. The dress came softly across Shelley's shoulders in the front, dipping down to show just a hint of her soft skin. Her hair was taken up on the sides, accentuating her lovely face and jawline. Well, Shelley asked, what do you think? He shook his head. I can't think of words to express what I see. Sure you can, Eric. You're an educated man, she teased. She turned to look into the mirror and frowned. Is everything okay, he asked. Hmm. I'm just thinking that maybe I should have worn a br- She glanced up, realizing she was talking to Eric, not her daughter. Her cheeks turned pink. Um, never mind. But Eric could finish the sentence in his mind. Good grief, he muttered. They met the others in the lobby. I only have one thing to say, Justin announced. Eric, you are one lucky man. Shelly giggled and kissed him on the cheek. And don't you all look nice in your suits, she praised. Justin offered Shelly his arm, then offered his other arm to Ricky, who offered his 
arm to Jason. You guys are crazy, Shelly laughed. This looks like a scene from The Wizard of Oz. They headed toward the door and Shelly's eyes grew wide. We're going in that? She pointed to a huge limousine parked out in front of the hotel. Yes, we're going in that, Eric mocked, his eyes twinkling. Oh, wow, Shelly exclaimed gleefully. Oh, this is going to be so cool. She caught herself, looked around at the smiling man, raised her chin. I mean, how lovely. Inside the limo, the men got a kick out of watching her play with all the amenities. They arrived at the restaurant and were led to a large table where the three sponsors were already seated. Shelly's hands began to tremble and Eric gave them a squeeze. You'll do fine, he whispered. His hands were warm and strong and she wished he wouldn't let go. The three men stood at their approach. Eric spoke first. Shelly Adams, I'd like to present Alan Bearden, Dick Johnson, and Lynn Fontaine. Gentlemen, our newest champ. Shelly smiled and extended her hand with each which each man shook, but Mr. Fontaine didn't let go. This simply cannot be the same woman we saw fight yesterday. I must have looked a fright yesterday, Shelley said. Well, you looked very tough and maybe a little worse for wear, yet this evening you look like an angel. He held a chair for her and she sat gracefully, glancing at Eric, who smiled reassuringly. The men shook hands and were seated. Mr. Bearden ordered champagne and Eric winked at Shelley. Alan is a representative of Nike, Eric explained to Shelley. Dick is here for Mattel, specializing in dolls, and Lynn deals mostly in film promotion. Eric asked the men about their wives and children, which led to a long explanation of how Alan Bearden's grandson got the raw end of the deal from a high school football coach. Mr. Bearden turned apologetically to Shelley. I suppose we're being rude and boring. Maybe we should change our conversation to something other than football. Shelley shrugged. Not at all. My heart goes out to your grandson. I think high school football can do a lot to make or break a young man. There's probably a lot of raw talent out there that never gets acknowledged because of politics. They say high school and college football is big business, and unfortunately, where there's money involved, there is corruption. She shook her head. I'd like to think the coaches truly care about the students and their futures and push them toward colleges and hype them to college scouts, but from what I'm hearing from you and from a few friends of mine, that isn't always the case. I think if your grandson really believes in himself, he should just walk on at a Division I school. All seven men gaped at Shelley, and Eric grinned at her, and she suddenly felt self-conscious. I, uh, I'm sorry, she stammered. Sometimes I get a little carried away. How refreshing, Mr. Johnson finally spoke. Eric, I believe you've chosen well. Ms. Adams, would you care to dance? Shelley ended up dancing with all seven men before the food arrived, and she sat down heavily. Come now, Lynn Fontaine teased. Fontaine teased. An athlete isn't supposed to tire so easily. Well, it is seven to one, Shelley reminded him. Still, she admitted to herself she was even more tired than she should be and thought she was probably still feeling the effects of her injuries. As they dined, they chatted about yesterday's tournament, with Shelley venturing to offer her opinion when she had one. So tell us, Ms. Adams, Mr. Bearden began, why do you want to participate in the mart? Her heart began to race. This was the part she dreaded. Shelley put her fork down and thought carefully about her response. I love the martial arts. I love the nobility and the beauty. I love the sincerity and character of those involved. And most of all, though, I want to learn to be master of myself. So I never have to submit to anyone simply because I'm smaller or weaker. She stopped and looked around, deciding, trying to decide if she'd said too much. Anything else? Mr. Johnson prodded. Well, um, there's the spiritual side of things. I mean... The gathering of knowledge and light is important to me, she glanced at Eric. I'm told the universe is full of mysteries just waiting to be discovered. Becoming perfect in something, in anything, is like a foothold into that realm. Like watch a ballet or listen to Mozart or watch a martial artist in action. They're all moving toward that perfection, that light and knowledge. Eric's gaze held pure admiration. So why the martial arts, Mr. Fontaine asked. Why not ballet? 
Well, actually, I tried ballet. I loved it, but the circumstances at the time didn't work out. That's okay, though, because I think a martial artist displays just as much beauty and perfection. She held her breath. You haven't even mentioned the money, Mr. Bearden said. Is it not motivational to you? Her brow furrowed. The money? All heads turned toward Eric. Darn, he'd forgotten to ask him not to mention it. I uh, I didn't tell her about the money. I wanted her to win the mark for other reasons, Eric explained. What money? Shelley asked again. Well, there's a significant amount of cash for the winners of the tournament in each division, Mr. Johnson answered. Oh, I knew about that, Shelley admitted. $10,000 could help quite a bit if I were to win. I'm not sure where you got your information, but you're a little off on the amount, Mr. Fontaine corrected. In the women's division, the prize is $500,000. Shelley's eyes opened wide. She grabbed her glass of champagne and downed the entire contents, which Mr. Fontaine refilled immediately. But that's not all. As a matter of fact, it's only the beginning, Mr. Fontaine added. The winners make millions of dollars in endorsements and film proceeds. Shelley drained her glass again. Millions? You've heard of Chavez Alta and Mimi Ray? They received their start at the mark. Mr. Fontaine tried to fill Shelley's glass again, but Eric placed his hand over it. I had no idea there was that much money involved, she smiled, but it certainly makes the pot sweeter. Dudley Moore in the movie Arthur popped into her mind when he says, I took the money. I'm not stupid. She giggled. Well, Eric, it looks to me like we have ourselves a real winner, Mr. Bearden announced, his companions in agreement. Mr. Fontaine filled everyone's glass. To our most lovely new champion, may she bring us many happy returns. Glasses clinked and were emptied. And with Eric distracted with the legal discussion that ensued, Shelley felt more and more like giggling as she guzzled champagne. Propping her elbows on the table, she rested her head on her hands and tried to pay attention, but her eyes slowly began to close. A loud bang woke her, and she realized her elbow had slipped off the table. Oops, she smiled, pushing her hair back out of her face. I lost my place. Bearden's eyebrows rose. Ricky covered his face with his hand to smother his laughter, and Eric stood. The champ isn't used to drinking. I'd better get her back and sobered up before our flight. Mr. Bearden turned to Justin, who would be representing Eric and Shelley. We'll have some contracts drawn up and get back to you. The men shook hands and took their leave. Eric led Shelley out to the car. Halfway out, though, Shelley stopped. Wait, she said a little too loudly. She pulled the hem of her dress up, exposing her ankles, and politely slipped out of her shoes. That's better, she murmured as she walked away. Eric rolled his eyes, scooped the shoes up, and placed them in her hands. He was trying to get Shelley into the car when she turned to him urgently. Eric, she said loudly. What is it? He answered, concerned at the urgency in her voice. Do you think I'm pretty? Ricky and Jason couldn't control their laughter. Eric only smiled. Uh, yes, sweetie, I think you're very pretty. Satisfied, she climbed into the limo, feeling completely content. Shelley leaned her head on Eric's shoulder and began to sing. I feel pretty, oh so pretty. I feel pretty and witty and gay. Suddenly she sat upright and spoke to the three who were sitting across from her. Did you know that Natalie Wood never sang one note in West Side Story? It was all dubbed. Ricky laughed. I I'd heard that. Did you know that, Jason? No. How about you, Justin? It's news to me, Justin chuckled. She turned to Eric. I think Natalie Wood is one of the most beautiful women that ever lived, don't you? He patted her knee. Natalie Wood was beautiful. They arrived at the hotel and pulled Shelley from the car. Wait, she yelled, pointing an accusing finger at Jason. Do you have my shoes? Chuckling, Jason held up his empty hands. You've got them, honey, Eric whispered. Ignoring him, she looked hard at Jason, then to Justin, back to Jason, and back to Justin. Did anybody ever tell you two you could pass for brothers? A burst of laughter erupted from the men. 
Oh, Shelley, we should liquor you up more often, Ricky wheezed, holding his side. Their jovial party caused a stir as they entered the hotel lobby, and the two men standing at the front desk turned immediately. Oh, Mr. Kino, excuse me, Mr. Kino. Eric looked up to see two of the directors from the tournament Shelley had just competed in. Glancing at his watch, he wondered what business could possibly be so important. I'm glad we caught you, one began. We heard you were heading to Atlanta early in the morning. Eric nodded. We are. Is there a problem? We, uh, we heard that your student had been roughed up in the locker room and ended up in the hospital. They stood in the center of the lobby talking while Eric tried to set them straight about what actually happened, glad that Shelley had finally let him in on what had transpired in the locker room. Shelley, bored with all the talk, meandered around the large mezzanine, stopping first to peer in the shop window where she'd bought her dress, and then moving on to other shops. Ricky kept track of her while his father reassured the directors that no complaint would be made. A well-dressed man stepped off the elevator, noticing Shelley immediately. He approached her, obviously thinking she was alone and available. Upon talking to her, he also discovered she was very friendly and very intoxicated. The man himself, not completely sober, had no idea four extremely lethal men watched his every move. The man put his hand on Shelley's shoulders. He spoke to her, and Shelley laughed, and slowly his hand slid down her back, and Shelley stiffened slightly and pulled away, but he leaned forward and talked to her reassuringly while his hand caressed her back. And that was enough. Eric motioned toward his son. You want some help? Jason asked. Thanks, Jason, but I think I got it. Be right back. Ricky calmly made his way to Shelley and took her by the hand. Come on, honey, he said. The man stopped Ricky with a hand on his shoulder. Ricky's eyes glanced at the offending hand and then moved slowly back up to the man's face. The guy was too inebriated to realize the danger he was in. Excuse me, but the lady and I were about to have a drink, he slurred as he slid his arm around Shelley's waist. Well, she's obviously had enough to drink, Ricky said softly. Is she your date? the man asked. She's my sister, Ricky lied, and I advise you to remove your hands from her. He tugged on Shelley's hand to pull her away, but the man had hold of her other arm. Shelley seemed quite amused, tossing her head back and forth to eye each man as he spoke. She's certainly old enough to decide for herself who she wants to go with. Aren't you gorgeous? Shelley smiled and energetically nodded yes to the question. Ricky watched the stranger's hand glide over, glide over Shelley's arm and prayed for control. He'd grown tired of the game. He leaned forward and whispered something into the man's ear. The man's face paled. He stepped back, looking Ricky over carefully. Ricky stood patiently waiting, his eyebrows raised. Finally, the man threw his hands up in surrender and left quickly. Ricky took Shelley's hand and led her back just as Eric's conversation ended. As the group stepped into the elevator, Shelley began to sing again. I could have danced all night, I could have danced all night, and still have begged for more. She turned to Ricky. Did you know that Audrey Hepburn never sang a note in My Fair Lady? It was all dubbed. Really? Ricky answered, beginning to chuckle again. She leaned her head back and closed her eyes dreamily. I think Audrey Hepburn is one of the most beautiful women that ever lived, don't you? Yes, they all agreed. Eric, Shelley asked as they stepped off the elevator, did we get the money? Yes, we did, he answered softly. Good, because I need some new shoes, she said, pulling up her dress. I lost mine. Ricky laughed so hard he tripped over Jason's foot, and Jason was laughing so hard he could barely pull him back up, and a man opened the door and glared at them as they went by, and Shelly put her finger to her lips. Shh, she hissed at him. Eric pulled on Shelly's arm and apologized to the man. Finally making it to Shelly's room, Eric leaned her against the wall while he fished for the key card. Jason, Justin, and Ricky moved down one more room. By the way, Rick, Jason asked, that guy that was hassling Shelly. What did you say to make him run away like that? Ricky appeared a little ashamed and shrugged his shoulders. I introduced myself. And, Justin prodded, 
And I told him if he touched her one more time, I was going to tear his freaking arms off. Freaking? Jason asked. Ricky shrugged. Close enough. Ha! Shelly laughed loudly. Tear his freaking arms off. That's great. Eric clapped a hand over Shelly's mouth and pulled her into her room as Ricky, Jason, and Justin tried again to control their fits of laughter. Eric sat Shelly on the bed and took her shoes out of her hands. She laid down giggling. Tear his freaking arms off. I'm going to tear your freaking arms off, she mocked loudly, laughing in delight. Eric ignored her jabber. Shelly, can you get out of that dress and get to bed You're by yourself? Yes, of course I can, she said as she stretched out and closed her eyes. Sighing, he pulled the blankets out from under her and covered her. She reached out to him. Let's snuggle, she pleaded. He smiled at her. You are in no condition to snuggle or do anything else. We have to catch a 5 a.m. flight, and we'll be lucky if you're sober enough for them to even allow us to board the plane. Shelly sat up. Are, are you saying I'm drunk? Eric pushed her down. You are most definitely drunk. She sat up again. Well, only a teensy-weensy bit. He pushed her gently down again and pulled the clasp out of her hair. Eric, she said dreamily, did you know that you're my father? Excuse me, he asked, clearly baffled. Did you know that you are my father? She said slowly, enunciating each word. Shelly, I don't understand. Well, if I'm Ricky's sister and you're his father, then that makes you my father too, right? Eric shook his head. Shh, we'll talk about it in the morning, okay? Smiling sweetly, Shelley agreed and snuggled up to her pillow. And that is the end of chapter 11.